Carolyn, the, there we go. There you go. Okay. You probably We're all got recording that. in progress. Um, so just because I sent a few emails out to other of our astrophotographers, uh, Dave and John, uh, let's see who else. Did you have any astrophotography to share this time? I don't, no. No, okay. And John, or do you want to well, wait until next time? Well, I do? just booted the computer up before I logged in and saw your email. So I I didn't find anything, but I do have a an old film picture of Mars on this computer that might be, uh, you know, on the on the topic that we're gonna be doing tonight. Well, maybe maybe you could show that at the end uh, sure after the Q and A. Whoa, fun. how long is it? It's just a picture of Mars. Oh, just a picture. Okay. Show well, the picture. So, Carolyn, is that okay? He shows that, and then you can show yours. Well, she didn't. Know yeah, sure. Saying. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see. I have to share screen. Yeah. And what do we want to do? Well, <laughs> okay. Yeah, this will be the thing that takes the longest. <laughs> now I have to pull the uh, picture up somewhere. <laughs> and it'll be in here. And, you know, we have all these pictures to look at, but <laughs> this is on a screensaver. Uh, there it is. All right, and you took that with your telescope? I took it with a uh, telescope in Milwaukee uh, in 88. So that's uh, near opposition in 88 uh, with a 12 inch telescope with film. We're not talking a thousand <laughs> images stack now. We're talking about a single frame. Yeah, so, that's yeah. amazing. Got to remember that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. First anyway, of all, Lo will be embarrassed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or jealous. Where's the canal? Right, Where's the canal? How do I? How do I get out of here now? I stop share. <laughs> there we go. So, <laughs> all right. Okay. So that's all I had. <laughs> so then, so yeah, we'll have Carolyn show uh, some of their. You know, I I got first light pictures from Carolyn and Mark uh, a week or two ago, I guess. Carolyn, but, give a little background but, on your telescope. Yeah. yeah, great. All right, so Explain can you guys see this? what that thing is. <laughs> yeah. Can you see okay. it all right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is an EV, this is a unistellar optics EV2, EV scope 2, and uh, sitting on our front deck. And this is the night that we did first light, which I think was the ninth. And since then, we've had nothing but wind and cold weather. So it's <laughs> Been a little bit difficult to uh, go through the collimation and focusing, but to give you a little uh, feel for it, it's um, got a field of view of 34 by 47 arc minutes, um, mirror diameter is four and a half inches, focal length 450, and it's uh, got a motorized Altas um, mount, so basically you can control it. In fact, I control it with my iPad at this point, or you can do it with a smartphone or whatever. Um, max magnitude it can go to is about 17 under our skies. It might go a little bit better. And what it does is it works by looking at whatever your object is and just taking uh, frame after frame after frame, and it does automatic stacking in, inside uh -huh. its own software. Wow. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of what that does. So that's what it looks like pointed straight up. And then you have to go through a little collimation process and a little focus process. Uh -huh. Collimation is pretty good on it, but it's not perfect yet. Um, the problem is you got to do it outside or looking at a star. And every time I try to do it, it gets windy. So it's a little bit more <laughs> difficult to do that than you might think. Um, so this is one of the first light images that we took of, of the Orion Nebula. This is about 20 seconds of the Orion Nebula. So you can see it's already starting to burn in on the trapezium. I did about an hour long, um, almost an hour long the other night. And it didn't turn out much better. But you can see I'm still having some problems with focus. So we're still working on that. Um, this is another one of our first light images. This was just eight seconds looking at the sky. So it basically, you tell it to do an automatic uh, field find and it, um, it's got a star, star database built into itself. And it basically looks at the sky and then says, oh, I know where I am. And then it takes about maybe up to a minute to be able to find exactly where it is and the, where it's pointing in the sky. And then you just tell it to go where you wanna go. 
and the app has a whole bunch of different um, targets where you can type in the RA and deck of what you want to look at. Or for example, some of us were trying to track James Webb Space Telescope. You can go and get an ephemeris for it and plug, plug that in. Um, this was probably the best picture we got that night. First quarter moon, and you can see it's still just a little bit out of focus. Um, and then this was the long exposure I did of the uh, of the Orion Nebula, and I just think it wasn't as we had a lot of problem with the wind that night as well. So you can see the stars are looking a little weird, but um, you know, so for right when, out of the box, for right out of the box, and you point it to the sky, it does this for you. You don't have to do much of anything. It's it's about as brainless as it gets. <laughs> Uh, just to explain to people who don't know, uh, the Orion Nebula is in the sword, right? Um, it's just, it's it's in the sword of Orion. It's a star birth region about 1,500 light years away. The central four stars, which are burned in in this image, uh, are called the trapezium. They're four newborn, relatively newborn stars. Um, this is all part of a larger cloud system called the Orion Molecular Cloud, which You'd have to zoom out to see the entire thing, but it includes things like the Flame Nebula and things like that. So um, uh, Hubble does a much better job than this does, but but it, this is pretty cool yeah. for you know almost almost an hour of of taking images. That's and that's great. it. That's what that's I got great. so far. That's great. So you know one of the th one of the things we're going to need to do is um, go go out and do a little bit better collimation on it. It's just a tweak on the collimation. Then I'm going to have to do the. Focusing, it comes with a Batonov mask that you can put on the front and use it to align your stars. But you, and it comes pretty well collimated, but they do tell you to go in and maybe collimate it once in a while. For every observation, you want to leave it out about 30 minutes before you start observing. And then you can, you take a flat, just to have a flat field, uh, a dark, a dark uh, frame and go from there. And so you can hook it up to the internet and show images live i haven't done that yet but that would be kind of a thing to do if i uh, part of the group that i belong to wants to do more star parties but we're really not getting into the in-person star parties right now mostly due to weather but also due to covid so um but we ordered you know this in they, november and it showed up in december yeah somebody had a question line there is you're gonna have fun yeah. <laughs> I think so. I think so. I'm, I'll put the uh, the link to the computer to the telescope in the chat so you can read more about it. Yeah, that's a yeah. great instrument. That it's looks... not a cheap thing, but um, I figure we're probably going to have it for a while. So <laughs> <laughs> that's that's great, really. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you for everyone for coming. Uh, let me say a couple things. If you can hear me, okay. Um, yeah, our next meeting will probably be five weeks from tonight. Uh, we'll let you know, and it'll be in the Mountain Messenger for those of you who get that. Uh, so it'll be Sunday, February 20th. And uh, we'll let you know later who that's going to be. <laughs> but well, yeah, be really Super appreciate Bowl, then. What was that? It won't be during the Super Bowl then. Oh, that's good. Yeah, we don't want to <laughs> compete with them. And it is the president's weekend. Uh, this weekend, of course, is Martin Luther King weekend. But, um, you know, I know we sometimes lose a few people if it's a long weekend to skiing or whatever. Um, but uh, that's probably the, the weekend it'll be. So uh, then next um, we'll have Leonard do his brief. Uh, yeah, let me get that thing done. Yeah, his, his brief. Um, international space missions update and uh we practiced this earlier so we're gonna try to do this Chug through I this, think. and you know john has it too if we have problems okay so let's see that looks good how about that yeah. <laughs> except for i need to get up to oh it's from the beginning okay here we go while you're doing that i just want to say hi to carol it's been a long time since i've seen you lady yeah <laughs> Wayne, he's going to go for that. Yeah. I mentioned your name. She said she was glad you're going to be here talking to us. And then, of course, as you know, I think you all know, um, with the four um, windows that show us on the right, you can always uh, go minus and uh, get rid of that so that it's not blocking the PowerPoint. Okay, Len. 
Okay, I'm, I'm going to go really quick here because, frankly, there's Carol's got a lot more information than I have uh, about you know what's what, what's going on with Mars. But uh, I'm going to uh, where gonna, am I on this thing? Well, hold on a second. You're uh, we still see your uh, slide screen, not the presentation screen. Really? Oh, there we go. Okay, wait a minute. Chaos. <laughs> Sorry, you don't I'm see the a... okay. Wait a minute, <laughs> like you see all the slides. Yes. Well, you see all the slides now, right? Yes, uh, we see all the slides, we don't see the presentation. So, you see just the beginning slide, but you don't see that. No, we did. No, we see the... okay. John, you want to take over? <laughs> oh, and you, right. you want to bring up yours? I'll stop sharing. Just click um, on it. I don't know. I hit from the beginning. We could just, oh, uh, you could just go through there a little, but uh, oh, hold on. No, no, he spent some time putting this together. Okay, uh, you want to share? Stop sharing. We'll let you do that. <laughs> hopefully, my computer won't pick up, pick up, pick up like you know it has. I have to. I'm sorry, I wasn't prepared for this. Um, talk to us yourself for a minute. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> um, let's see. Well, you know, I'll just talk it through yeah. before I sl yeah. do slides. I mean, clearly the, the, the James Webb Space Telescope, the JWST, the Just Wait Space Telescope has turned out to be a unbelievable uh, success story right at this moment. Still got a ways to go uh, before it gets out to the L2 point. Um, but I think everybody is, I mean, every morning I, I uh, communicate with a couple of people on the project and they're just ecstatic uh, how, how well things are going so far. And right now we're, we're, you know, we basically, I think is we've got three months to go trying to align all the mirrors, uh, but they're, the motors are working, the actuators are working Things are clicking together, and uh, you know, you know, I'm always worried about the launch. Never mind all this clicking, <laughs> but you know that, that thing went off, and uh, it's in route to uh, L2. So we we probably have one of the most amazing uh, opportunities with with the uh, James Webb uh, Telescope to uh, open up the universe like we've never seen it. And who knows what's on the other end of that line, uh, uh, the mirrors. Um, okay, that's, Aliens. that's probably Aliens. my delay <laughs> tactic. Uh, where are we? Well, so how many things have to go right before 132? Okay. I see John has started screen sharing, but I don't see anything. See, you thought you guys thought you had this; it was going to work so well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, hey, we we were yeah. more worried about you than us. I yeah, but we yeah we tried it. Out. I don't understand why it wouldn't do that. You know, I clicked uh, the first slide; we could see it, but you were seeing the whole thing. Well, let's go back to the some basic things. You know, whatever whatever was on there, just throw it on. Yeah, we'll just go What's down. And... You could do that. I'm back. Sorry, I. Yeah, just do that, and I'll just go down the thing. I'm. Right, I'm I could. want to get out of this as quick as possible. <laughs> oh, really? Come on, we love hearing you. Okay. I mean, we can go back to hey, that. If you I could go, and then you could go after. Hint, hint. <laughs> See where we are. I, I, I probably would be out of sync with some. There's a couple I'm things sorry. I want to say about Mars. That, well, uh, and then he wants to introduce you, Carol. So uh, <laughs> you me, um, we've known Carol, Carol Stoker for uh, 40 years since the first Case for Mars conference. Mm -hmm. And- um, They're revealing too much. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> when we were just little kids, you know, right? But um, yeah, and, and she went to CU Boulder too. Yeah, got her um, ast uh, astro, no wait. <laughs> geophysics degree there right? um let's see if this works oh i just uh started there we go okay okay 
Thank you, Next John. slide. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Okay, we did the Jim uh, James Webb uh, telescope. Uh, yeah, the alignment of the, all the segments of the mirror is underway. Uh, there we are in route to L2. Okay, I think I, I really, you know, as always, I try to pay attention to what the Chinese are doing because I think they're going to be the big story of, uh, of the decade. Uh, uh, they had, next slide. They had a, they got three person uh, crew on their space station right now in the core module. Uh, they're, they're really working hard. There's a lot of stuff happening as preparatory to uh, uh, next, this year, they're gonna have, uh, fly two more modules. Next, next slide. Uh, uh, they're really working hard on getting the remote uh, manipulator arm on the uh, space station to actually do some tests of how they're gonna move modules that are gonna come up to their space station and align uh, with the core module. And it's gonna be a big year for, for China on the space station. Uh, they, they're hoping to get done with the entire sequence of launches. And uh, two, I think it's two more human crews are gonna go up there and, uh, and start in, in, inhabiting this uh, facility by the end of the year. So they're moving along. Uh, things are, are working out pretty well. They did an autonomous uh, uh, concept for moving a, a module from one place to another. And then they did a manual uh, inside the space station, the three person crew uh, moved their module. And it's not, you know, I don't want to make too much of this, but it's it's really significant given um, how fast the station is going to come together by the end of, of this year. And uh, let's see how uh, this plays out internationally, because I think there's really opportunity for China to use this as a diplomatic uh, a station to include more countries uh, involved in their facility. And somewhere along the track, I really think the US is gonna stand up and take notice of what they're doing. And we'll have a collaborative capability uh, for rescue, for you know, using the facilities up there. So anyway, next thing. Uh, one of the things that is fascinating with me is the, uh, you kind of forget there's a far side rover on the moon. This is China's U-2-2. Uh, um, it basically is uh, uh, exploring the South Pole Aiken Basin, uh, the Von Karman Crater there. And uh, it landed in uh, January of 2019, still doing a lot of stuff. It's taken over, uh, as of last week, uh, some thousand photos of different uh, lunar uh, topography. Next thing. And one of the wacko stories that even I got sucked up into, the, the damn rover took a picture on the horizon and found this kind of crazy, what, the, what, what China called the mystery hut. <laughs> and it, it turned the internet into chaos with people saying it's a, you know, alien base to, uh, you know, McDonald's, you know, it's being built okay. that we didn't know about. Um, and it turns out the, the rover, the U-2 two rover actually drove close enough so they could actually find out what the, what this feature was. And here's the next picture. It's a rock. <laughs> well, it, it, it's a strange story that just went through the internet like crazy. And so anyway, uh, the U2 rover took a picture of this damn thing. It was a, some, a fairly large boulder or rock on the crater rim. And I guess they're gonna inspect that uh, in the coming weeks uh, much closer. So. Didn't turn out to be the mystery hut. It was amazing uh, internet fascination. 
Next thing. Uh, you know, our own Mars uh, exploration program at NASA is doing incredible things. We forget that Curiosity has been very busy on Mars. It landed in 2012 and it's taking, right now it's crawling up, uh, you know, uh, uh, Gale Crater uh, and the uh, Mount Sharp. And the pictures that it's relaying as of yesterday are pretty incredible. They're really uh, uh, closing in on a uh, sedimentary layers at Mars and Carol can certainly talk a little bit about that. The next picture shows you how close this damn rover got uh, with, with its uh, capability. This is the kind of sedimentary layer that people um, you know, fathom over. <laughs> you know, it's pretty cool. I mean, that thing has taken some incredible pictures. Meanwhile, next next slide. And what's it called, the Pro? Yeah, it's called the Pro. Prow. 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 Yeah, it, it's just a layering effect on Mars. And then you got, uh, people have totally forgot, we have another lander on Mars that NASA la uh, landed, uh, InSight. And it's in a little bit of a, uh, a dusty situation where the uh, uh, the layers of dust on its solar uh, rays are uh, creating a power uh, shutdown. It's going into hibernation mode right now. In the next, uh, in a, probably a week or so, come back up to up to speed. Uh, then you have that. That's a picture from Insight, uh, the NASA Mars lander. Good next cool. thing, and here's Perseverance. I mean, Perseverance is, is moving around Jezero Crater. It's doing some pretty cool things. A lot of imagery. Not quite sure what we're, we're looking at yet. Um, and this is an area that uh, I think Carol is going to be discussing a little bit about Mars sample return. I mean, we're uh, drilling into a couple of these locations of rocks uh, that people uh, think have something to say. And maybe in the future, we'll haul back through a Mars uh, sample return mission. But uh, Perseverance is doing pretty good work uh, rolling around. Uh, next thing. Uh, this just happened today. Pretty cool. Uh, it's not a space story yet, but it has. This is some huge plane that is built. Uh, by uh, the money came from um, who's our rich guy? He's uh, he's gone now, but he uh, uh, anyway he, yeah. he put a lot of money into the, probably the largest uh, aircraft by wingspan that has ever been built. And uh, anyway, this thing took off from Mojave. Uh, uh, spaceport today and did the longest flight it's ever done at the highest altitude. It's going to be used for dropping some hypersonic uh, 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 test vehicles uh, on a new pylon they're going to put in the middle of this thing. Next slide. Did you say it was Stratolaunch? A Stratolaunch. It's yeah. called Stratolaunch and uh, it, it pretty amazing uh, oh. capability. And this is a story you got to watch because this thing is tremendously capable of hauling up uh, uh, space vehicles that can uh, launch from the from that space from this plane into orbit, and so uh, it's, it's a really uh, fantastic test that happened today. It was totally, as far as I know, it was totally successful and set a new altitude and speed record. So keep an eye on that. And the guy, Paul, Paul Allen, Allen. <laughs> before he died, he, he really thought this was the way to go and he invested heavily in this space uh, carrier aircraft. And I think that's enough for me. Okay. And let me, <clears throat> let me get to Carol. Uh, a great friend over the decades, uh, you know, <clears throat> I can't even, I have to take 
memory okay. pills to remember mm -hmm. everything that we've done over the decades. I mean, it's just an amazing career she's had. I met her as a student at the University of Colorado Boulder. And, you know, <clears throat> even me, I knew she's going to be a rising star. And, uh, you know, she was with Chris McKay. Uh, there was a, a Mars underground of experts at the university, uh, including Penny Boston and uh, just, just a, uh, a confab of experts that were looking at terraforming of Mars. And that's what, that's what drew me into what they were doing as research. But uh, Carol now is a research scientist in the Space Science Division at NASA Ames Research Center uh, in San Francisco near San Francisco, and uh, she earned her PhD in astrogeophysics uh, at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, she's worked on lots of Mars studies and missions, and particularly the uh, always drawn to the search for life on the red planet. And, uh, you know, of all the people I know that uh, I'm proud to know it's Carol. Have at. <laughs> Actually, um, I'm going to interrupt for two seconds. Um, Leonard just talked about the Case for Mars conference, and Kelly shared this with me. And we thought this would be great to share with you all. Oh, shoot. Hold on two seconds. Bam, bam. <laughs> <laughs> you, oh. you, spo <laughs> spoiled them the whole thing. I saw it. Yeah, Briefly. I know you did. <laughs> Something oh. happens when you start screen sharing. Mark Arnold asked that slow. question because that's what the question I was going to ask was, you know, were they going to have continuity? Or were they going to just turn it over? Huh? Or were they going to just shut it down? And they're They've not. been sentenced for life. Yeah. Oh my God, it's a video. It's a video. <laughs> <laughs> can watch it. Um, and Leonard talks, gives, doing an interview during the whole thing. I didn't want to take up a ton of time, uh, but it's about 30 minutes long. But let me uh, share that link with you guys and you can all watch it later. But uh, Carol, it's great to have you. Wow. Talk to I'm, us tonight. I'm impressed. I saw Bob Zubin's side of his face and <laughs> I heard yeah. myself talking, but Penny's head showing. So <laughs> sorry, I didn't. To me, it was uh, cutting in and out and I didn't want to. Uh, to yeah. Uh, Okay. For me, it was off the record, so I couldn't use it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's out on YouTube. Here's the link for it. Go ahead and take it away, Carol. All right, I'm gonna share my share my screen now. You should be seeing Marvin the Martian. Yeah, we do. And <laughs> and just to let you know, you know, uh, John and and Carol and Leonard and I were all trying to make sure this worked today. And NASA uh, has some heavy duty restrictions on, uh, you know, Carol or anybody, <laughs> NASA going out to uh, that, you know, uh, what you can't have uh, Dropbox on your computer because you've got a NASA computer. So, um, so just to let you know on that, and that's why you're not seeing it full screen. Yeah. Okay. It's Carol. NASA. It's, it's it's trying to frame the future. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't. They didn't approve Marsha. <laughs> what the uh, hell are you talking about? Mar Marcel? <laughs> I don't know. Both. All right. All right. Yeah. Calm okay. down. Calm we'll down. be quiet now. Let me get talking. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to talk to you about where to search for extant life on Mars. Um, many of you probably think we've been looking for life on Mars all this time. Uh, but here's, uh, here's a map of Mars. I'm going to be showing a lot of maps. Uh, and this is, shows the location of all the successful landers. The unsuccessful landers have X dra X's drawn through them. Uh, so this is where all the successful Mars landers uh, have landed, with the exception of ExoMars, which is um, upcoming. That's a European uh, mission. So, um, and now Mars 2020 is called Perseverance. So um, the only missions that have ever even attempted to look for evidence of life in the way I think of it 
uh, things that live and breathe were the Viking missions. And the Viking missions happened in 1976. And they, uh, here's the young Carl Sagan standing in front of a Viking lander who was the lander itself. Carl, of course, wasn't really standing on Mars. The lander was a mock-up and it was set up in Death Valley for a photo op for Carl. So uh, Carl was kind of the, you know, at the time he was the most famous scientist on earth. And um, I see many of you probably remember Carl because uh, you're old enough to remember Carl, <laughs> as am I. Um, but when Carl was in kind of mid-career and the, the, hot, the hottest thing in science, uh, I was a graduate student. So, um, and as a matter of fact, I started graduate school the year Viking landed on Mars, 1976. So uh, this was the first time any successful landing on Mars had taken place. There were two identical landers, one and two. Uh, lander one was at mid-latitudes, <clears throat> a mid-latitude site, and lander two was at a high-latitude site. Um, the focus of the mission was life detection. It was uh, had three life detection instruments. Each lander had an, an identical payload. So each uh, lander had three life detection instruments and the instruments were designed to search for evidence of soil bacteria. There was also an organic analysis instrument. This wasn't really one of the life detection instruments, but it, it was designed to look for just simple presence of organic compounds. So uh, the idea of all three of these experiments, again, these are you know, biology as of 1970. <laughs> how, how did you do bacterial, you know, soil bacteria, search for soil bacteria in 1970? Well, you, you basically looked a in a Petri dish, used a Petri dish kind of uh, an experiment. So these were um, robotically uh, built Petri dish type experiments. Uh, and each one of them took in a soil sample. There were three independent ways of doing this, but each one of them took in a soil sample and did something to it uh, to try to initiate growth. So, um, There were uh, a pre-planned set of um, observations that would, by you know, the, the design of the experiment would indicate that there was a biological response. And all three of the experiments gave a initial response as soon as, uh, generally the way it worked is there would be a nutrient or water added to the soil. And, water with nutrients in it. And then you would look for evolved gases, what came out of the soil as a result of putting water and nutrients in. And all three of the experiments gave an unexpectedly reactive result. And as a grad student, me reading this, I was like, they found life on Mars. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> the, uh, the investigators themselves uh, were more skeptical. So they, they had a control version of this experiment where they first heated the soil to a temperature that was not a fully sterilizing temperature, but it was a temperature they figured would kill any soil microbes uh, prior to putting the nutrients into it. So they basically did the control experiment and two of the three life detection experiments still gave a positive result, meaning they still saw these reactions. The third one, which was called the labeled release, that's the one in the middle here, um, did not. The label release experiment uh, did no longer saw a reaction. So, uh, but they, the uh, experimental protocol required that if you got a positive response, you had to get it from all three uh, instruments in order for you to not think that one of the instruments was just wrong. So there was a kind of a, a truth table that was applied to these results. So um, 
anyway, the uh, label released instrument results were fully consistent with the biological explanation. The other two instrument results were not. But then the, the uh, fourth instrument, this is the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer or organic analyzer showed that there were no organics in the soil. And this was thought kind of by consensus to rule out biology. This can't be biology because if okay. it were biology, there would be um, a lot more organics in the soil than there would be actual living organisms because the dead bodies of the organisms would also be organics. So, um, so that was thought to be, to rule out a bio biological explanation for what they were seeing. And it turns out, and it took many years to understand this, but it turns out that that was an incorrect interpretation. We, in science, you call it false negative. Um, <clears throat> in fact, the Curiosity mission proved organics are present on Mars and Viking missed them. And it proved it using another gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. So we'll kind of get into that a little more about that later. So um, that's kind of where things sat. It, it was taken, uh, it, was, it was sort of represented to the public and you know, science is always about packaging your story to, to give it so that the president can talk about it or the politician can talk about it. You know, it has to be very simply packaged. So the simple packaging said, there's no life on Mars, Viking didn't detect life on Mars. And that was taken to, to become a paradigm that said, there's no life on Mars. We don't have to worry about life on Mars anymore. It's not there. And again, primarily because of the lack of organic compounds. So uh, for many decades in the entire Mars program that you have seen since Viking, uh, has focused on a let's look for life on Mars, but let's look for it in, a, in the fossil form. Basically, let's look at it when uh, we can see all this evidence that Mars was warm and wet early in its history and probably had liquid water, probably had liquid water oceans. And we can see all kinds of evidence of that geologically. So let's, let's do geology missions that look for fossils. And that's kind of the program that we're in. And anything to do with uh, extant life has been sort of off the table for uh, almost 40 years or 45 years. So um, until uh, just before we um, <clears throat> went into the pandemic tailspin, there was a uh, really interesting workshop that was held in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Um, and it was called Mars Extant Life, what's next? <laughs> and I was at that workshop and um, there were a number of people. Uh, it was a, you know, really stimulating. It was kind of like uh, when Case for Mars got started, it was like the, the people who believed there could be life on Mars, extant life on Mars, were able to come out of the closet and be in a a, a group where other people thought that too. And then that was, you know, very enabling for those people. So, um, so basically uh, this slide here illustrates the four types of environments that were discussed in the workshop uh, as potential sites to host extant life. And really what it's about is the entire surface of Mars is probably not habitable. But there, there could very well be uh, specialized places, special niches where life is eking out an existence. And always what the limitation of whether life can eke out an existence or not is the presence of liquid water. Because Mars is cold and dry by terrestrial standards, no matter how you look at it. So um, these four sites are uh, ground ice, and in most of my talk, I'm going to actually focus on ground ice because it's my favorite. Um, there's also uh, salts and brines as a potential niche. Caves, uh, essentially subsurface pockets where liquid water could occur and it's warmer and wetter than at the surface. And then finally, there's some recent evidence of deep subsurface liquid water aquifers. So 
down way deep, there might be liquid water, which um, has always been warm and wet and still is. So um, I'm gonna go through these one at a time, <clears throat> starting with ground ice. So up until quite recently, <clears throat> it was thought that ground ice was confined to only uh, very high latitudes, like above 60 degrees north. Um, <clears throat> but uh, a very, very recent analysis uh, done by a fellow named Piquot uh, and his colleagues, he's actually at JPL, uh, used data from the Mars Climate Sounder. This is a uh, infrared radiometer type measurement. Uh, and then they modeled uh, a kind of a two layer uh, structure of ground ice with dry soil over the top. And they uh, <clears throat> used temperature as the thing that they matched to the climate model sound sounder. And they uh, came up with this um, analysis of where is ground ice on the entire surface of Mars. Um, and this is the plot that is in their paper, their 2019 paper. Um, now, in the meantime, actually, before this happened, going back to uh, 2009, the high rise imager, which has been in orbit around Mars for like almost two decades now, uh, was repeatedly imaging a lot of places on Mars and found. Uh, they started finding these places that if you looked back at an old image, you would see nothing. And then a new image would show you the meteor had hit the ground and it had exposed ice. And over here on the right is an example of that. It was actually the discovery image that was published in 2009. Um, so the white squares on here are all the places where new meteor impacts have exposed white ice. Um, the red squares on here are places where new meteor impacts did not expose white ice. Um, but the, again, the Piqua map is showing the depth to which the ice layer should be. And so all these blue areas, the ice layer should be no more than uh, 20 centimeters under the surface. So this is really close to the surface. And in, in some places, it's um, it's even less than that. So again, you go high latitudes, it's very close to the surface, but even in large areas of the mid latitudes, they're uh, less than a meter from the surface uh, is ground ice. And this, these black areas are areas where this uh, analysis didn't work because there are big um, dust covered areas of Mars, which the dust itself should be a good thermal blanket, allowing ice to be under that, but this method would not reveal it because it relies on uh, dust-free surface. So, um, <clears throat> so basically all latitudes above 40 degrees no north have ground ice within a meter of the surface. And uh, that's a new interesting thing. So there's really lots of areas on Mars where uh, at least ice is present. Uh, and these mid-latitude ices, at least if they were at the surface, could be quite warm. Um, so then, you, you know, there's been a lot of work over the last decade or so trying to understand uh, how did this ice get there and uh, what, what climate state is Mars in now and what climate state has it been in recently in the past. So it turns out that the tilt of the Mars axis, what's called the obliquity, uh, changes over time. And it changes actually very fast over time and to a very large uh, uh, degree. I mean, uh, currently the obliquity of Mars is 25 degrees. Five million years ago, it was 45 degrees uh, and actually 35 on average over all of time. So it's, this is a plot here on the bottom um, of the obliquity over the last 10 million years. And you can see that it is doing these very large excursions up and down. And you think about this on earth, uh, the ice ages are also caused by um, 
changes in the Earth's obliquity, but on, in the Earth, it's only changing by a couple of degrees, like two or three degrees, but it's enough to cause global glaciation on Earth. Um, so basically, uh, at 35 degrees obliquity, you can have significant melting of high latitude ground ice uh, at, you know, anywhere. So uh, this is the average obliquity. So the last 4 million years, the time that we're actually sampling ourselves is much colder than average. And furthermore, uh, the, the northern plains, so the northern hemisphere of Mars uh, is at aphelion during northern summer. So the uh, orbit of Mars is sufficiently eccentric that it makes a difference whether summer occurs at perihelion or aphelion. Quite a big difference. And uh, so we're kind of in a worst case time for uh, making the uh, ice on Mars the coldest it can be <laughs> right now. <laughs> it gets warmer pretty recently in the past. And uh, so here's, here's another slide that kind of illustrates that how warm is it? So this is really from a, a climate model from uh, uh, Mark Richardson and uh, <clears throat> Richardson and his colleague, uh, Mike Misha, Michina. Um, and this is called the, uh, it's called the degree days above freezing. So it's, it's the number of days per year that it's above freezing um, across Mars. And, um, and they, they're actually doing it in terms of could liquid water form. So it's pressure and temperature conditions both allow water to form. So this is current conditions. And this is 45 degree obliquity condition, right? So this is, you can see that the number of warm days moves poleward. Um, and there are many, it's not hundreds, but it's many days that it could be above freezing in the uh, uh, higher latitude locations. So even more recently, Mike Mellon and Hannah Sizemore, Mike Mellon is another Colorado resident. <clears throat> um, they have done a, uh, a model of what the ground ice, where does ground ice move to during these warm excursions? And this is a plot from their paper that just came out in Icarus. And this is on the bottom thing here. This is obliquity over the last two and a half million years. So you're seeing, as you go back, you're seeing the up and downs of obliquity. And then on the top here, this is the depth of the ice table for different landing sites on Mars. So Phoenix being uh, a mission that was actually landed in polar ground ice, it's uh, 67 degrees north. Um, but here in the green is the Curiosity mission and the Chinese Zhurong mission. <laughs> and look at that, the ground ice comes almost all the way to the surface. This is almost like a centimeter below the surface. And this is, you know, half a million years ago. So this is very, um, very interesting that ground ice is, is what's really happening is the ice, when the, the, uh, when the obliquity is high, the ice is sublimating off the poles and it is being deposited into these mid-latitude locations. And then as you can see in this period here, the ice shouldn't be anywhere near the surface, but what is in fact apparently happening is that the ice is out of equilibrium. So these are, you know, where should it be in equilibrium? But out of equilibrium, it's still in the process of evaporating and, and sublimating. Um, and the thing is that when it gets really uh, warm, the ice itself is a habitable environment because there's enough water in the ice that it would allow microbial growth. So, um, yes? I'm sorry, um, Wayne's got a question. Do you want questions during the talk or would you like us to wait till afterwards? Uh, let's wait. All right. 
Okay, okay so um, some of us uh, actually going back to right after the Phoenix mission realized that, um, that there was a, a case to be made for the polar ground ice being warm periodically uh, to be a habitable environment. And we proposed a discovery mission called Icebreaker uh, to look for extant life in that polar ground ice. Um, in fact, we have submitted that proposal twice. It has not been selected, but it has uh, gotten a lot of attention. And, um, and it uh, may someday actually become a mission that flies. I hope so anyway. Um, but it is uh, taking advantage of the fact that the ground ice becomes warm enough in certain locations to host metabolism. And um, so you could drill into the ice and an icebreaker uses a one meter drill. This is a drill, actually the drill that we proposed using is the same drill that is now uh, flying on the Viper mission to the moon. Similarly, its uh, use on the moon is to uh, reveal the presence of ice on the moon. So uh, our idea was to drill into the ice, uh, pull the samples up and put them into a couple of different uh, classes of biomolecule detection instruments. And these are instruments that are not just general organics, but could actually dif differentiate and distinguish between uh, biomolecules and non-biological organic molecules. Okay, so that's uh, this, the ice story. I'm gonna now talk about salts. Um, so again, here's a map. This is a color-coded elevation map. That's what the colors mean. Um, but these white, dots here all across the surface are uh, suspected chloride salt deposits. Um, this is, you know, sodium chloride kind of salts. And um, what you can see is that they're all in the highlands. These are this bluish and greenish material. This is higher elevation stuff. Uh, generally, all of our Mars missions have landed in these uh, b dark blue regions. And the reason is because there's, it makes it easier to land, you know, basically. Um, so this is the, the, what's called the Southern Highlands. And uh, 640 of these sites have been identified. So the salts themselves are potentially a, a habitable environment. And the reason is because uh, they can obtain water from atmospheric humidity via a process that's called deliquescence. Uh, also, if you had a liquid water body, you know, if you had a, a playa and it dried up, uh, you can leave behind salt crystals and inside those salt crystals are viable microbial colonies that can survive just in the water that was left in the salt crystal for up to 100 million years. Uh, so even if you find these salt crystals and the, the uh, microbes are not viable anymore, they're uh, pretty well preserved. You would be able to detect those um, with probably the instruments on Icebreaker. Um, so uh, my colleague Alfonso de Villa studies the, uh, the endolithic microbes that live in the salt deposits in the Atacama Desert. And that's these, this little green layer here. Um, and these are pulling water in during periods of high relative humidity by deliquescence, and they're living on that. Well, another uh, fascinating thing actually has to do with the Phoenix lander. And this, this was the lander that, that touched down in 2008 at 68 degrees north on ice rich terrain. It's, uh, job, its primary objective was to sample the ice. Um, but it made a, a discovery that was completely unexpected and had nothing to do with sampling the ice, but it has now become uh, a, a serious line of research. It's kind of one of those, uh, we just got lucky on that one. Um, 
So the discovery is that something like 1% of the Mars soil is this weird salt that is called perchlorate. The chemical formula is a uh, magnesium or calcium or sodium, and then a chlorine and four oxygens, and then uh, up to eight water molecules stick to that. So it is, um, why, why is perchlorate important? Well, first of all, it's a very, it's these, um, these oxygens there are, are able to basically uh, be used like O2 to burn things. So if you put like a sugar cube and, uh, and sit it in a um, teaspoon of perchlorate and heat it up with a flame, it will instantly uh, burn. You'll get a, you know, a big, like not exactly explosive, but you, you will, you will create a fire. Maybe that's what caused that fire in Boulder <laughs> in Denver. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> it very likely burned the organ organic carbon that was in the soil that was put into the Viking gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. Uh, it's actually known that the uh, Viking GCMS um, was, took the soil in, heated it up, and then the evolved gases were analyzed by a mass spec. But the heating stage would have caused any organics present <clears throat> and the perchlorate to combust, and the product that it, they would produce would be carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide was seen by the Viking GCMS after the heating stage. So um, it's actually logical that that is what happened. The other thing is it's antifreeze. It can lower the freezing point of water to minus 70 degrees centigrade, actually minus 75. And those are the typical temperatures found in the Mars polar regions today. Um, so in fact, there's... Uh, a good case that uh, some of the features we're seeing are caused by liquid water that's resulting from having this extremely good antifreeze on Mars. The other thing is it's very strongly deliquescent. Uh, if I was hoping I could actually find a video of this, but I've seen videos where you actually put a little bit of perchlorate and then just watch it turn into uh, a water drop. And it happens pretty fast. But basically, the perchlorate salts suck water out of the atmosphere. And uh, they don't really care how cold or warm it is. What they care about is the, is the relative humidity. So when the, when the relative humidity exceeds 80%, the perchlorate crystals become water drops. And then once they become water drops, they don't want to give that water up. They'll hold on to it until the relative humidity drops down to something like 20 or even 10 percent. So somebody has uh, <clears throat> looked at where could this occur on the surface of Mars. That person is uh, Ed Rivera Valentin and his colleagues. And they had a paper published in Nature Astronomy in 2020 that showed uh, this plot. So the top here is the water activity. and uh, values from 0.55 to 0.8. So water activity is the ratio between the uh, vapor pressure over the briny solution compared to the vapor pressure over pure liquid water. So it is a number that seems to uh, demonstrate or, or uh, it's, it's been used to understand how well bacteria can access water in a brine. So uh, basically for microbial growth, almost anything that we've ever been able to measure uh, has had to have water activity greater than 0 0.6 in order for growth to occur. Um, the thing is that on Mars right now, that only occurs that the brines form when the uh, relative humidity exceeds 80%. And that is only happening when it's really, really cold. And that's because even though at many of these locations, they're low latitude locations, it might get up to um, you know, above 
freezing. It might get up to 10 C during the day, but the relative humidity is a function of temperature. And uh, during the day when the temperature is high, the relative humidity is really, really low. So deliquescence will not occur. But when it's cold and at night, as you see in Colorado, you know, you'll get frost forming on the ground. Uh, even though the air in Colorado is really dry, it will actually uh, precipitate out once it gets cold enough. So that's basically what's happening on Mars. At, at night, uh, you can have liquid water occurring, but it's occurring when it's really cold. Well, the other thing that people think about microbes, um, at least based on terrestrial analogs, is that <clears throat> um, the temperature has to be above minus 25 degrees centigrade. That's for anything we know about on Earth. But uh, again, is it, is it Earth microbes that we're looking for on Mars? <laughs> or is it something else? Um, who knows? OK, so th then finally, uh, moving on to caves. Um, here is another map from Cushing et al. And it's showing the location of uh, cave entrances around the Tharsis volcano shield. So these are uh, basically what, you're, what they're looking for is holes in the ground, windows or dark things on the spots on the ground that you can't see the floor of. If you can see the floor, it's a crater. If you can't see the floor, uh, it's a lava tube probably, or the skylight of a lava tube. So with this method, they've found over a thousand cave entrances. Um, and the uh, caver people think that caves can provide a habitable environment because they can be warmer and wetter than the surface and they can be shielded and are shielded from ultraviolet and cosmic radiation. So uh, troglodytes are the things that live in caves, <laughs> the people, the bacteria that live in caves. Um, but microbes in terrestrial caves are pretty hard to distinguish from rock by looking at them. They actually, uh, my colleague uh, Diana Northrup, who studies um, cave microbiology, calls them three Ms, microbes masquerading as minerals. And basically these things uh, in caves can be um, associated with water drops. Uh, they can be films of a different looking mineral. They're crusty, you know, you can knock them off with a, with a chipping device or with the rock hammer. Uh, but to really know what's going on, she looks at them with scanning electron microscopy. And there you see these really elaborate weird structures that are microbially formed uh, mineral structures, but they're like nothing else that any other microbes do. The soil micro microbes do not do this. It seems to be really unique to cave microbes. Um, so the thing is that caves are uh, an interesting target for sure. And, um, and of course, if, if you want your crew to be safe, you might want to put them under the ground because you know it'll be away from cosmic rays and, and solar storms and stuff like that. Um, but it's, uh, it's not that easy to get into them because you know once you're in, down in the cave, you're not communicating with the surface. It's gonna be very tricky to do that. But because of the advent of these little uh, helicopters like Ingenuity, which I think is a fantastic uh, innovation that Perseverance uh, brought brought to high TRL, brought to a, an ability to actually fly this on future missions. Uh, you could fly a little helicopter down one of those skylights just with a humidity sensor and a temperature sensor and be able to tell right away, uh, is that a habitable environment down in that cave? Just fly it straight down and straight back up. Uh, it would be a real simple mission and it wouldn't be very dif different than what Ingenuity is already doing. To actually do sampling, however, uh, that might very well take cavers. I mean, even designing robots to do that, I, I think is a big stretch. Okay, finally, 
and I'm about to wrap this up. Um, there's the case for deep subsurface water. And again, there, this is just very recently that this case has been um, made. So basically there is a, uh, a ground penetrating radar called Marsus that has been uh, flying around Mars for a decade or more um, and had found no evidence. It was actually uh, flown to look for subsurface liquid water. But up until quite recently, there was never any evidence uh, published that they'd found it. Um, but just recently, uh, a team from Italy, and the ground penetrating radar is actually an Italian uh, instrument. This team from Italy did a reanalysis of all their old data and did a lot of signal to noise processing to try to get the signal out of the noise. And they published this paper. In fact, the Laurel et al. Nature Astronomy paper was the second paper they published. Um, and, and they also published this map, which is below. Uh, this is basically just the idea of the ground penetrating radar on the spacecraft. This is the map they published. And this is supposed to be, this is under the south polar layer terrain. So this is like under the south polar cap. And what it's supposed to be showing is these radar bright areas that they po proposed were uh, evidence of briny liquid water at a depth of one and a half kilometers. Well, uh, once that paper came out, there were quite there was quite a buzz about it, and uh, and several other papers came out that kind of refuted it. So the other papers claimed that there, it was too cold for liquid even for chlorate brine at one and a half kilometers depth. Um, and then more recently, uh, another publication uh, from Cooler and Plot um, showed that there were more than just these couple of little spots. Um, these were, you know, like kilometer sized lakes, as they claimed. But now there were more of these spots and they were at even shallower depths and shallower depths should be even colder. So that would be even less likely to be liquid water. So uh, others have been proposing that these are either clay deposits or conductive ice, but they're not liquid water. So maybe, maybe this case is really hasn't been fully made yet. Uh, in any case, uh, water that's at a kilometer or more beneath the surface is going to be fairly difficult to get at and uh, would definitely benefit from having human crews. But I don't think we're ever going to land human crews, or at least won't happen very soon, that we'll land human crews in the south pole of Mars. All right, so uh, one thing that I think is um, needs to be said is that, uh, and that is the, the issue of or the risk of back contamination of the earth from uh, material brought back from Mars by terrestrial astronauts. As, as you guys undoubtedly know, you, you folks undoubtedly know, there's uh, you know, now the richest man in the world, Elon Musk, with his private fortune, fully intends to send people to Mars and is building the infrastructure and the, and the technology to do that. And uh, I'm actually very happy that that's happening. It's, uh, I've waited my entire career for something like that to happen. But I think it is still risky to uh, send people to Mars and bring stuff back. Because if you send people to Mars and bring them home, uh, they're going to bring Martian materials with them and possibly in them. Um, and we have done nothing since Viking to really realistically evaluate the risk of uh, having Martian materials brought back to Earth. And in fact, the Perseverance rover, which is the first step in a Mars sample return mission, might not even have gotten its samples back by the time that Elon is talking about putting people on Mars. And even if they do, they are very unlikely to be the right samples for, from the point of view of looking for evidence of life. 
Um, now the argument has been made, Bob Zubrin makes it whenever I bring this up, <laughs> um, that it's very low risk because Martian materials are, that are capable of hosting viable microbes arrive on Earth at an average rate of 10 kilograms per year. So Earth may already be contaminated by Martian life. Uh, that's, a, that's a reasonable argument, but the counter argument is that it's a very high consequence. If you're wrong, contamination of Earth by competitive alien species could be very bad. And there are numerous examples of imported alien species disrupting ecosystems on Earth. Um, you know, the rabbits in Australia, for example, <laughs> um, or this guy, <laughs> or both these guys. Anyway, um, just to conclude, if Carl Sagan were alive today, I'm sure he'd say, it's been 45 years since Viking. Isn't, time, isn't it about time we resume, resume the search for extant life on Mars? And that's, that's all I have to say, and I'll take some questions. I can't hear you. Yeah, I need to stop sharing. OK, I'm stopping. Yeah, thank you so much, Carol. We like doing the clapping thing here, too, even if you can't hear us. Um, but yeah, questions, comments? Um, I bet we have some. Wayne. Yeah, Jim Langstead here. I have a question. How, how do the geophysicists uh, fig, uh, put together this chart that shows the obliquity over 10 million years? Uh, that is not done by uh, geophysicists. That's done by mathematicians, actually, or by it's uh, it's a solution to um, basically the 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 reason the Earth doesn't do this is because it has a moon and stabilizes its orbit. Um, it's the solution to the equations of motion of the entire solar system. So it's the perturbations from the uh, giant planets on Mars. Mars, of course, closer to the giant planets. And it's sort of, uh, you can solve the equation of motion for the whole sol solar system. And uh, you can do it for the Earth. You can do it for Mars. So there's a, a French mathematician named Lascar who first published this in the early 2000s. Um, and that plot is used by everybody from the work that Lascar did. And I believe he also did it in the 90s, 1990s for the earth and um, explained the, essentially the mutation of the earth um, with the, this kind of a solution. Thank you. And Wayne, do you have a question? Yeah, I'm curious, when uh, water ice erupts on Mars and it sublimates, how much is lost forever and how much is retained by Mars? Well, it doesn't erupt, it, it sublimates. Is it, you know, as it gets warmer, it's in the soil. Basically the ground ice and soil are kind of mixed together or maybe there's even pure ice layers. But the pure ice layers are actually the most difficult to explain because in order to get a pure ice layer, and we saw that on Phoenix. There's definitely pure ice layers on Phoenix. Uh, you kind of have to have snow. You have to have liquid water involved to get pure ice. Um, but you can actually get vapor deposited ice mixed into soil. And that undoubtedly happens as well. <coughs> but it doesn't go anywhere. I mean, uh, the goes, it moves around but it doesn't leave the planet. Um, if there's ice, I mean, if there's water vapor in the Martian atmosphere, uh, some of it can get photo dissociated into hydrogen and oxygen and the hydrogen can escape. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, uh, it's a, a process that has resulted in mass loss of water, total water over the history of Mars. But that's on a kind of billions of year time scale. Any other questions or comments? 
I have a question. Um, we talked, you talked about it kind of in your last slide about the, you know, reintroduction of microbes. It seems like the pivot from doing extant exploration of life on Mars to these other missions gave NASA an excuse not to do this. Is that correct? Or is this, you know? Well, I actually see it as being something slightly different than that. Um, it's sort of um, the, the, by far, again, it's just kind of my opinion, by far the dominant community in planetary science, uh, and especially traditionally, has been the ge geological community. I mean, going back to the exploration of the moon. Um, and the, after Viking, so Viking was this mission that, the geology community kind of had their own mission idea and then an elevator conversation literally between uh, a biologist and the Na then NASA administrator resulted in the Viking mission getting uh, sort of put into the queue ahead of the geologist mission. And so suddenly the biologists were in charge. The geologists were not happy. And, uh, and then they came out with a Oh, we didn't find life. The geologists were happy. Okay, well, let's, that's gone away. Let's get back to doing the serious business of geology. <laughs> but what happened was as a result of there's no life on Mars, public interest completely shifted and suddenly there was no interest in doing any Mars missions. And that was for a very long time, like 20 years. So a whole career with, you know, your scientific career was lost because there's no life on Mars. And so at some point um, there was, meanwhile, the only mission data there was for that 20 year period was the Viking orbiter imaging. And the Viking orbiter imaging showed all this evidence of liquid water, all these channels and you know, flood plains and all this different stuff. Um, and so uh, it started to become a thing to talk about, well, what about when Mars was warm and wet in the early time. And that early time when Mars was warm and wet was happened to be about the same time that life started on Earth. So there should have probably been life started on Mars if it started on Earth, the conditions were similar. Uh, in fact, there was a lot of exchange of material between Earth and Mars. It could have started one place and, and uh, you know, actually contaminated the other or you know, started it at the other. Um, so those things led to a uh, sort of a new strategy of let's go look for the ancient evidence of life and we can still be looking for life and we can get the public behind us again because we're looking for life. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's kind of a win-win, but the other, the other factor, and it's a significant factor, is that Viking was able to uh, get permission to do its mission by sterilizing the entire spacecraft, which was very expensive. At the time that Viking flew, it was an Apollo scale uh, price tag. So the most expensive mission ever built at the time, for sure. Um, and the, uh, the later missions did not want to pay for complete st uh, spacecraft sterilization. So they basically relied on there's no life on Mars. There's nothing we're going to contaminate. And therefore, we don't need to sterilize our spacecraft. And furthermore, the planetary protection policies uh, were written that said, if you're going to look for life on Mars, you do have to sterilize your spacecraft. So then that became another reason not to do it, because it would be more expensive. You'd have to sterilize your spacecraft. So that's kind of the rub that we've been in for all these years. Well, thanks. Okay, Carol, guys. I have a question. Well, Carol, I have a question for you. Have you seen the story from Carnegie about the reanalysis of the Allen Hills meteorite? Um, in, in crusting that, 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 that they found on there that they thought was life. And now it turns out it's probably really just uh, um, due to interact chemical interactions between water and the rocks. That was just released in the last day or two. Uh, I have not seen that, but um, 
the Allen Hills meteorite story, um, you know, that's a whole class in itself. <laughs> I mean, there has been so many different proofs that the uh, Allen Hills meteorite evidence of life is somehow not caused by life, that uh, it's the entire field of astrobiology was started just to do that, you know. Um, again, I've always been a skeptic on the side of exactly what Dave McKay said when he first published the, that it wasn't just that one line of evidence showed that there was life. It was the multiple lines of evidence, all of which had independently could be formed by something else, but it was the fact that they all were together that seemed to have the simplest explanation be that they were biological. And the part that I always thought was, um, was the best evidence of that was actually the uh, chains of uh, magnetite, which uh, that part is very hard to do abiologically. Maybe not impossible, but hard. So anyway, it's, yeah, I think this it's, latest one you know, doesn't address the magnetite. So, but yeah. you know, the thing is that um, that is our Mars sample return. You know that that rock is a Mars sample return. What makes us think that rocks that Curiosity is drilling right now, or not Curiosity, but Perseverance, and is going to bring back to Earth, are going to be any less confusing than that rock? or any less controversial about whether the evidence is good or bad. Fossil life is really difficult to prove is actually ever was life. Unless it's a dinosaur bone, unless it's you know a whole skeleton or whatever. If it's fossils of bacteria are really, really hard to prove um, was ever alive. Or comments? Okay, hey, Pat, I got Dr. one. I, I'm comments. curious what you think about uh, the, the, the woes and worries and hopes and aspirations of finding life on Mars. And then let's back away and say, we've got a whole new community of outer planet people that are so hungry for life detection on Enceladus and uh, Europa. I mean, what is what is the search for life on Mars uh, tell us about how difficult uh, the search on those other worlds may be? I mean, here we are after decades, like you're talking about, that we're still scratching our head. Um, you know. Oh, I, I actually think that that's a very, um, it's a very important point that, you know, everybody is on the bandwagon of search for life now, but Mars has kind of been left in the dust. <laughs> um, oh, and we got, we got another new shiny object. We've got Europa, we've got Enceladus, we've got, you know, uh, all these places, my God, they seem to have subsurface water and they got ice on their surfaces. And, you know, of course, we're going to be able to land on them and, and, do a Viking-like analysis and instantly find life. That's the lesson to me: is that uh, don't don't be so cocky. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's uh, that the plausibility of those outer planet satellites having water in their subsurface liquid water oceans is uh, not is not that compelling in my opinion. And, and it's because that you might be able to live there if you could get there, if you could put life there, but actually getting life to start there is a uh, much more difficult problem. And um, the, the people who are actually looking at or working on the origin of life hypothesis, and I don't know if you're, uh, you keep up with uh, Bruce Damer, and Dave Deemer, but you know they're doing really interesting work, and they their um, uh, hypothesis is that you have to have wet dry cycling, and you don't really get that on these outer you know deep subsurface water kind of bodies. So um, 
It's not a slam dunk at all. Just because what you have water doesn't mean, I mean, you have to have water to have life as we know it. But just because you have water doesn't mean you're going to have life as we know it. Okay, folks, uh, I got to go. Um, you seem to have frozen. Maybe I already was did there go. Was there someone else? <laughs> What's frozen? Uh, oh. Your feeds are freezing. No. I'm losing, I'm losing lock. <laughs> Ground control to Major Tom. <laughs> <laughs> really well okay. thank you so much carol carol you know, thanks we, we, we really, yeah all of us <laughs> yeah thank you so much truly appreciate this and just so you know kelly mcmillan's on here too and who you know very well and uh Hi, kelly. <laughs> yeah uh, and uh david warner's from uh colorado springs astronomical society and we're very honored to have him come join us too. He's uh, their education and outreach person, I believe. And uh, anyone else? I, did somebody else, when Leonard was starting to talk, uh, have a question? Thought I heard somebody. No? Okay. Um, well, so yeah, if you want to stay on longer, we could let Carol go. I, I think it's just about her dinner time, maybe. Oh, and I wanted to mention Larry Lemke, her husband, was uh, one of the two people on our UFO uh, Zoom conference. I think that was about a year ago. Um, I think I have weird ideas. What about my husband? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Mr. UFO? <laughs> Really? That's okay, I, I gotta go. We'll let you go. Thanks, Thanks Carol. Sarah. It was good to see you. Thanks, for doing it. Thanks so much. Bye -bye. We appreciate really. it. Thank you. Onward. <laughs> and if other people want to stay and talk among ourselves, or if you do have other questions you want us to um, get to Carol, uh, you know, we'd be glad to do that too. Anyone? <laughs> Okay, yeah. we're getting late. Yeah. I, I, I hear football playoffs calling me along with dinner. Oh, okay. Do they, do they do that yeah. Sunday night? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they are uh, Chiefs and Steelers. Oh, right now. <laughs> okay. Well, truly appreciate okay. you coming to us. It's eight o'clock. Really. Well, DDRs make it all possible. So, yeah, that's true. Then you don't have to watch the commercials. Yep. Yeah. <laughs>